How are you? It's Kevin Kenny. This is the Build Series live from New York City, and we are joined on stage right now by our guest who is uh, on tour across North America. Going to be playing Irving Plaza here in New York City, and nice enough to make some time for us here today. Please give it up for Lucy Silvis. <laughs> Thank you. We were just chatting. We had to cut you off there. We were talking about how this uh, space we're in right now, if you're watching at home, used to be a Tower Records. But you grew up all over the place. You didn't have Tower. You had a bunch of different record stores. We but where? had, I mean, sorry. I didn't even know you please. a question. Um, in, in England, yeah, we had the HMVs, which we still have. Um, we had Virgin Records, which we had the, the record stores. In New Zealand, I can't even really remember. I was so young when I was growing up there. I can't really remember. But I had loads of vinyls growing up. And I had the seven inches as well, which right. were my favorite thing in a little uh, porcelain jukebox, which yeah. I really loved. The so. original iPod in some respects, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, I kind of miss it. So Right. Yeah. And that's code for single, guys. If you're young, the seven inch, that was the single. <laughs> yes. 45 RPM. <laughs> uh, well, no, I was kind of, it's interesting we start there because I think it's a big part of your story. And something I want to ask you about as an artist is you really moved around a lot growing up and really up until I guess you kind of settled down recently in a beautiful yeah. home now in Nashville. Mm -hmm. How has settling down though and not being so nomadic affected you as an artist, if it has at all? It, it, you know what, that's actually a really good question because I think the moving around can definitely lend to opening your mind and you, it changes you as a person when you move around a lot. I think it's helped me become more open-minded to all different types of ways of living and and when you're an artist you want to be creative so you want to get some inspiration wherever you go but I think settling in Nashville has helped me feel centered enough to concentrate purely on the music but then you know as creative people you're always looking to sort of put a pin in anything that's right. almost too settled so we have that sort of destruct button that makes us go well this feels too nice and too normal right. <laughs> I think I'm going to change it all so um but Nashville's such a special place I've never experience something so unique as a community where you could have your life and everyday life be completely normal and then be surrounded by that kind of talent and be able to set your goals really high at the same time as living a completely normal life. Oh, yeah. have you have you found yourself almost like more adventurous sonically because the home life is so settled almost like you, like you talk about putting a pin in it like needing to do something <laughs> yeah. are you taking more chances a bit now? Um, I think so musically well it's it's not even that it I don't see it as taking chances I just see it as having freedom so right. you it just feels because I love it there so much and I'm surrounded by music and I'm surrounded by people and it, you know it's always very important who you surround yourself with in your life um, people that know you and can deal with your worst side but also people that really bring out the best side of you and I feel like I have that in Nashville and it's allowed me to go I'm going to do everything that I've ever wanted to do uh, musically uh, it's it it felt easy and there was an opportunity to do that in Nashville and um, yeah it's it's really led me down loads of different roads that have brought me to here which have made me just feel very liberated. It almost feels like you've been down every conceivable road as a professional artist, musician, what <laughs> have you, because you were a platinum selling signed major label artist over in the UK, and now you're doing the independent thing as an American artist, and this was completely independent, right? Yes. Right. Completely. Round of applause for that, because I know that's that's like a <laughs> sexy thing to say these days, but it is, oh my God, that, and you can attest to this, it's a heavy lift, putting out a, a body of work this good, totally independent. Well, thank you. I think, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing, you're right about that, but the word in Dependent is one of the sexiest words we can say because we want that's how especially as a woman we want to feel that way we want to feel um and and that comes from being with a guy that's made me feel like I could be like that and I could just have my independence and do exactly what I wanted but um but musically there are challenges like you say it's heavy lifting that's a good way to describe it um, getting your music out to the world takes a long time when you're sort of on your own. But there is such a, I feel so proud because I did it financially on my own. I had this incredible talent around me that wanted to be part of it. I wanted to be part of their story somehow. And knowing that I could just record the album I wanted without any opinions telling me what genre I need to be in, how I need to put this out, who I need to sing to, was, was a really incredible thing to be able to do. I'm ready to cue Frank Sinatra my way. Do we have that on deck? <laughs> 
Uh, I love that song. Oh, I know, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's really what we're talking yeah. about here. Um, again, there's so many interesting things I want to talk to you about. You've been down so many different roads, as I, as I said, and you've also done some really interesting things. Not to bring up uh, something from probably 15 years ago at this point, but it really piqued my interest when I heard about it. You covered a Metallica song one time for yes, a record. I did. Um, I It was one of those things, because I grew up on a lot of Motown and a lot of blues and, and jazz and all that kind of stuff. Which is and exactly my, Metallica. It was exactly Metallica. <laughs> but my sister was a t Metallica. Metallica fan and she always she she said to me one day you should cover nothing else matters and play it on the piano and I said oh I could try it I don't really know if, if I could pull that off and I'd heard the Michael Kamen version of nothing else matters where they have the full orchestra so we went in the studio and then we went to Abbey Road in London and we had this 32 piece uh, orchestra playing Nothing Else Matters. I kind of wanted to do it as a subtle thing on my first album. I thought, I'll just put it on there, it's a cover. And it became this big deal in Europe. It, it, and it went to number one over there. We played it in all these, we played it with the Metropole Orchestra in Holland um, at the Heineken Music Hall, which was a big moment for me. And it became something I didn't even think it would become. So um, a few Metallica fans weren't, weren't thrilled with me covering that song well, you had to get it, metallica's approval of course did, yeah you, like who do you call is there like a leader of metallica like is it lars just call lars no 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 um he was on speed dial on my yeah. phone um no i we actually contacted their manager and they heard my version of the demo and they they gave me their approval and it it was great because i was so honored to cover a song like that with such a legendary band but also it opened it up to an audience um, that were my audience, or maybe a different audience that had been opened up before. So, yeah. head banging at a Lucy show for Absolutely. a little while there. Right? Some, well, yeah, it's a slow version, so it'd have to be a, <laughs> a slow head bang. Yes, anyway. very gentle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's something that probably a lot of fans wouldn't expect you to listen to back then. What's something today you're listening to that we might be surprised to learn? I mean, I know the whole world is obsessed with Billie Eilish, but I am one of them. Cause oh, I, really? Okay. Yes, what do you me. like about Billie Eilish? Because I think it's kind of fascinating. She's obviously very talented. Very but talented. I, but yeah. I'm struck by just how uh, broad the appeal is for her. It's, it, it is because I think it's, the, it's how eloquent she is with every, all the lyrics she's saying. And when you find out that she's only 17 or something, it's just there's singing and then there's singing like that. It's very delicate. It's very smart, mm. the way she's singing. And um, I think the subject matter obviously touches her age group. But to people that are older, you're kind of like, wow, to be that aware of your surroundings. I mean, I don't know what I was doing when I was 17, but right. it's not that. Yeah. So, I mean, well, you're on your way to going platinum at 17. Uh, I mean, don't well, sell yourself short. But no, but she, but she was just, it's the expression of it and it's the fearlessness of it. And I think when you look at an artist like that, I mean, there's artists, I, I mean, I'm old school as well. I like mm. it, everything from Jackie Wilson to Frank Sinatra and Fleetwood Mac and all that stuff. But I think now it's like anyone that goes out there, um, you know, and is bold and isn't afraid to express themselves and isn't afraid not to be liked by some people um, is something that I really admire and that's what makes you stand out. Yeah. Just from a songwriting perspective, I really, what I appreciate about Billy that ties into what you do, especially coming from Nashville, is the word economy. She makes every word matter, it seems like, lyrically. Yes. And that's something as a songwriter I'd love to get into with you because what some people might not know is you're a pretty accomplished songwriter. Not only do you write for yourself, but you write for other people. And I guess early on, you made the transition from... Uh, you were an artist, but then you were just predominantly writing uh, for other people. And yeah. then you decided at some point, you're like, no, I like the stage. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that decision early on? I did. It was one of those things. It was just me going with the flow. I mean, I think I did fall into songwriting, moved from London to Nashville. Um, that was, I was so enamored with the town and it was a town of songwriters. And I think I wanted to find my way. I didn't really know as an artist. I wasn't ready to make a record yet. And this was sort of between, uh, you know, 2007 Oh, 2008, I put out an album. And then I did make a lot of music. I was in the studio. I even recorded some songs at Jamiroquai's, uh, JK's place in London, which was something I was doing all these different things. Then moved to Nashville, and it wasn't till 2015 I put out Letters to Ghosts, and that's a big gap. But to me, I mean, I don't even know where that time went. I was always in the studio, always writing, always creating. And you're right, uh, while I enjoyed the songwriting, I missed being on the road. I missed being in front of people. Singing just brings me so much joy. It makes me feel so much, so peaceful. And that part had to come back again. So. Right. I was talking to, uh, you remember the R&B singer Ashanti? 
Oh, yeah. I was talking to her last week, and she's a big songwriter, too, in, in, in her genre. Yeah. And I asked her a question of if she could go back in time and take back a song that she happened to give to another artist, what would it be? Can I ask you that question? Is there something that you look back, you're like, you know what, Reba? Re <laughs> or somebody, I don't know. <laughs> I did have a song with Reba. I but, but um, But I, do you know what? I don't know if I would take it back. I mean, because it, it was everything lands in the perfect place. But lyrically, there was a song I wrote with a, a British singer-songwriter called Egg White, and it was a song called Who Am I? And um, it was covered by an artist called Will Young. And um, I remember it was very poignant at the time lyrically, and it was saying, who am I to tell you I would never let you down? And I was going through that time in a relationship where I was saying, this is, I, this is such a tall order, what we're doing here. We're young and we're in this relationship. And it felt so um, autobiographical. So it was kind of like, oh, I wish I could sing that. I've never actually recorded a version of it, but um, maybe one day I will. But. Well, it begs the question, like at what point in a songwriting process do you, like session, sessions aside, right? Like what point do you realize this song's for me, the songs might be for someone else? <sighs> I don't know. Sometimes I feel like there's songs on this record and there were songs I wrote with this record in mind that ended up going somewhere else. But um, I think I get a feeling like there's one song that um, I'm going to play in, in a little while, which I knew from the get go that it was for me. It's just a feeling that I get where lyrically I've said something I really needed to say. And um, and if I'm in the room with another artist, then usually I'm there because they, they, we want to figure out what they want to say. So um, I don't know. It, it really is a bit, it's sort of last minute. What decision. song is that that you're going to perform for us? That you're Everything to? looks beautiful. Okay. Um, I knew that I wanted this, uh, you know, old old school ballad that I wanted to write. I knew exactly how I wanted it to sound, how I wanted the backing vocals to sound. And um, when we were writing it in Nashville, we wrote it just on a Wurlitzer, and it, literally from the first verse, I could hear myself singing it. Wow. There's a song I want to ask you about that I guess is like you can call the current single Black Jeans. Yes. Now there's a uh, lyric in this, and if I butcher it, I apologize, but it's like, <laughs> I th like maybe in my black jeans you wouldn't even recognize me. Is it something like that? Yeah. Wouldn't you see me? Yeah. It's very sandy from Greece of you, right? <laughs> Slightly different material. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I, it's funny. It's actually, that's funny that you would pick that up because there is that thing, even though I thought she looked beautiful the whole way along the movie. Right. I thought she didn't need to what change. What was Danny but, thinking? Yeah, what was he thinking? But I think that was the thing. That's the thing about this song it's not really about a, like a literal pair of black jeans it's more a thing of there's something simple and classic about black jeans they never go out of style they're not necessarily a trend they're something you put on because you feel good in them and I was never wa wanted to follow any trend I never wanted to be anything that somebody else wanted to, me to be and um, at times when I've run into that I've really found it I found I wanted to retreat and and not sort of be looked at. And the Black Jean song is a, a really good metaphor for that, just saying, I'm not gonna take a back seat, but I'm not gonna be the kind of person that puts myself in the spotlight being something I'm not. Right. Speaking of Greece, I didn't think we talked about Greece, but it just piqued my, uh, my, my mind, is that a lot of, like, um, something I hear a lot in your reviews is 60s Southern California. <laughs> yes. Is, now, is that just, like, a coincidence, or is that, like, something, is that an era you really love? Like, why does that come up so much in reviews? It is what I love. I grew up with um, some, you know, sort of the Laurel Canyon sort of vibe of, of, of Carol King, and yeah. uh, the, even those writers like Joni Mitchell and James Taylor, that was something, as a songwriter, that influ influenced me because... I grew up listening to singers like Aretha and I loved, you know, Ray Charles and even Barbara Streisand. I loved uh, Fleetwood Mac. But as songwriters, I think that's when I really honed in on that kind of sound. It felt dreamy. It felt free. It, I don't know. I just and also the Beach Boys and, mm. uh, you know, Pet Sounds and anything that Phil Spector did, that kind of lush cinematic landscape that they used to do. And um, when we we're in the studio, it felt just fun to go there with these kinds of songs. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about Black Jeans just before. Yeah. Uh, that video is out right now. And yes. you worked with, is it Gerard K? Uh, right? Jared K. That Jared sounds K. very, that K. sounds really, really, even, I think he'd like that. Gerard. That's, yeah, it's a little exotic. Gerard. If you're, Kevin, if you're watching get... Gerard, I Gerard love that Gerard from Kevon. <laughs> there you go. Jared K. Yeah. Um, but you also did the kite video with him too. Yes. So what do you like working with him so much? He's, he's brilliant. He's a genius in every way. He's a musician. He's a producer. He produced our friend Rustin Kelly's album. We wrote a song on my album called Just For The Record, which is on EGO. He's a musician, he's a singer, he's a director. He's got so many, I mean, he's one of these people that just be like, you know, 
uh, he bakes, you know, he's a cook, like everything. He's, but with Kite, I just, I like to work with people that really want to understand me, understand what I'm trying to do. I want it to be fun. And I know that we have a goal to achieve, but we had so much fun together. We came up with the Kite video concept. We knew we wanted it to be like a, you know, a mimicking of this robot woman that this guy had created. And it, it, we shot it really easy. We shot it in six hours wow. for, I think it was under $8,000 that we made the video for and um, a small crew of five people. Oh, wow. And Black Jeans, we shot in his house. So, oh, yeah. and it was just, you know, the way he did the color and the black and white. He's just so clever and he's one of my closest friends in the world. And I just, I'm honored to honestly work with him in any creative way I can. And he might bake for you. He might. So he has baked bonus. for me, and you know he can't eat gluten. So I've told him whatever. To, I'm fine with whatever. So there you go. But, is that what you shot at the house? You're like, hey, maybe I'll have my chances. No, no exactly. I was right hoping there. he would cook me dinner afterwards, but yeah. he didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> all right, let's get to uh, some Twitter questions right now. This comes from at Danny Young Drums. Uh, Lucy, <laughs> who is your favorite bald drummer? They must know. <laughs> um, his name's Brian. <laughs> I know that Danny's watching this, and um, he's actually about to come on stage with me, so he's just being cheeky. So, Danny, you are my favorite drummer. You're the best ever. No one compares to you. There you go. <laughs> uh, let's get to the next one. Kiki. Kiki's not here, is she? Kiki's not no. here. Not that I know of. Darn. Uh, hey, hi, Lucy. Uh, what has been the most difficult song you've ever written and why? Mm, that's a good question. Um... I think Villain, uh, there's a song called Villain from my album Letters to Ghosts, which uh, was quite difficult. It was, I wrote it actually with my friend Marin Morris and a guy called Dave Barnes in Nashville, an incredible artist as well. And um, I think we, you know, all settled on this notion that when you come out of a relationship, you know what you did wrong, but you also know that you can't be held uh, more than 50% accountable for whatever happened. And uh, and it was just, you know, sometimes when you're writing a song, you, it's cathartic and you write yourself out of that situation and make sense of it during that process. Come out of it going, wow, I, I realized what I did wrong. And Villain was kind of opening eye-opening for me, knowing that what he would have to say was true and what I would have to say is also true. So it's uh, it was a good song for that, but but emotionally tricky. You feel like you're a more honest songwriter now than say you were when you started writing music? No, I was always I always told the truth in songs. I look All back right. on my songs in 2004. Lyrically, I think I was always honest. In other ways, I think it's not that I wasn't honest, it's just that I wasn't open enough as I am now. I was very when I started out as an artist, it just the, the music industry kind of it was something that was strange to be a part of. It be coming up as an artist, being a backing singer, touring, coming up through that way and then being faced with the music industry was something that kind of jarred me slightly. So when I released my first album, I don't know if I ever felt, I don't know if that time I felt completely myself. Lyrically I was, but in other ways I was trying, trying to sort of hide behind my songs in a way and not be completely visible to Reveal people. Everything. Yeah. Uh, let's get to the first in-studio audience question. It'll come from right up front. What's your name? Hi. Hi, my name is Jay. Hi, um, nice I you. love all of your songs, and I love your writing. Thank you. Um, specifically, my favorite is Kite and Changing My Mind. Oh. They're amazing. Thank you. Um, my question to you is, I'm also a singer-songwriter, but what's your process to writing a song? Um, well, I think it's different for everybody. I'm interested to know what your process is because it depends who I'm in the room with. If I'm, you know, I could start an idea by myself, but usually I like to be in the room with a guitar. I don't play guitar. So if I'm in the room with a guitar player, he'll play, you know, a riff or something that I like or chords that I like and I'll start singing something. Usually it's me mumbling something and then words will come out or I'll have a lyric idea first. I'll know you know, with, with songs like Kite, that actually came out of a process of talking about a friend that we knew. She had broken up with her boyfriend because he was too controlling. And uh, we were like, ooh, someone's going to try and hold on to that kite, you know. And uh, so we wrote that song. And, um, and I think it's being open to inspiration wherever you go and remembering writing down things. You know, I write things down all the time in my phone or somewhere and um, try and remember them for later and... and uh, but I think, do you write by yourself? Yes. You do? That's awesome. <laughs> and I often don't have the discipline to finish. I'll start something and then I need to take it to someone to get, get me to finish it. So, yeah. Cool. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, second one right here. What's your name? Um, 
My name's Camilla, Hi. and my question is, when did you know that you wanted to like do this as a career? Um, I always knew that I wanted to do it. I mean, I've, I've asked my parents before when I started singing and they said, you know, maybe three, four years old, just singing all the time, humming. And uh, I think as a career, I think as soon as I started to see artists on TV or music videos or that stuff, maybe I was seven or eight, I'd be trying to mimic them. And I, and I just, I kind of assumed, not in, a, not in a presumptuous or arrogant way, I just thought, I'm gonna do that. It wasn't anything, I didn't really understand the full scope of what I was walking into, but I just thought it wasn't even a decision. It just, it was always just there for me to do. And I think when that's in you, um, you'll just, you're just open to it. You're just there, you're already there doing it, yeah. It's awesome. Uh, now, you're going to be really nice. You're performing, as we mentioned before. How many songs? Can you tell us that? I'm going to do three. Ooh. I mean, I can do more if they want me to. I but All I night, a marathon? Yes. <laughs> Lock the doors. You have a show yeah. tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Really quick, right. if you're watching and you don't happen to live in the area of New York City, you are on this tour. Um, and you, you're like halfway, is that fair to say? We've done, I've actually, not even halfway. Not We've even done halfway. four shows already. We okay. play in New York uh, tomorrow night, and then we're going all over middle America, over to the West Coast. We end on May 13th. Beautiful. So, yeah. And those dates are available? Yes, online, on my Instagram. There will be a post somewhere down there, and I'm reposting them every so often, but on lucysilvers.com, you can find all the dates. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. You're uh, joining us live right now on buildseries.com. Don't go anywhere. Lucy performing three songs, as you just said, coming up. One more time, guys, for Lucy. Thank you.